Thanks, folks, for the warm welcome and for the kind words, Liz. There's only one falsehood in what Liz said earlier on. Um, it wasn't so much an ask. She threatened bodily harm against me if I didn't accept. This is why it's the second time that I'm here. But who can say no to Liz or to any of the McIsaac clan, I guess is the way to put it. Um, I was actually very um, pleasantly surprised that there are so many returning Five Good advi Ideas participants. Um, the first time I did it, I learned as much as I shared. Um, I was involved in a follow-up exercise around the book, around the subject of, of Five Good Ideas. And again, tremendous insights from different people with different perspectives. Um, I'm not presenting here, uh, maybe a thought leader is, is accurate, but an expert, uh, that would be going too far. In fact, I will very humbly tell you, anybody that presents themselves in this day and age as an expert on security and justice is probably fooling themselves. The fact of the matter is the world has changed so much and is changing so much more, so much faster, so much differently than any time before. You're about as expert as you can be coming out of the back end of the last security or justice incident that you, your family, your business, or even your society has been through. It's one of the challenges for a small and, biz and, small and medium-sized business leader is that the world is just changing faster than your resources um, and your ability to even conceive. You're so busy heads down trying to run a business, get through payroll, make sure the bottom line ends up on your right side. Um, you know, dealing with staff issues, your everything from accounts receivable to IT. There's not a lot of time to look up at the horizon like I do and look around corners and figure out what's coming to hit your business and prepare yourself. Nor is there the amount of capital or operating budget to allow you to do that. So you are uniquely challenged with this uniquely challenging period. The other thing I want to say, and I think you folks know it, Canada runs on small and medium-sized businesses. Although most of the work that I do is for Bay Street executives and large multinational organizations, the fact of the matter is, you're the folks that employ the most people. You were before. So that makes you incredibly powerful, incredibly important, and I believe incredibly influential, although I'm not quite sure you're punching at the weight class that you actually carry. The more that you can inform yourselves around the good, the bad, and the ugly of what you're going through, the more you're going to run successful businesses, the more your employees are going to feel safe and valued, the more your customers are going to feel safe and wanting to come back like you as repeat customers to a highly valuable event. So I'm going to try to share some ideas with you. They're not all the ideas and not, not necessarily all the solutions that you're looking for, but hopefully it will add to what you've already been doing, validate some of what you've already been done, have already done, and maybe even inspire you to do a little bit more in, in ways that you hadn't considered before. So with that context, and my last caveat, I don't know if anybody has hay fever in here, but for whatever reason, this weekend, my allergies kicked into a whole new gear. All right, I guess Mother Nature finally brought spring and the pollen has arrived, so if you see me about to sneeze, it's because I probably am, the front row should probably duck. I do appreciate the ability to use some PowerPoint. It's not so much because you need to write down what's on the screen. It's more just keeping me on track so I don't go over time. Although certainly if there's some ideas that you want to quickly scribble down or put into your cell phone, that would be a great thing to do. I touched on this in my opening comments. Um, I'm going to start off talking about trends that are impacting businesses around the world. And the first thing, and I, I reference this, is the, the nature of change. It is exponential in the way that it is happening both in terms of the speed. I was at my uh, parents' place last night for my son's fifth birthday, and I just thought about how much the world has changed since he was actually born five years ago. In terms of geopolitical activities, in terms of the advance of, of the fourth industrial revolution, in terms of what we see in terms of technology and how much it's disrupted so many different industries, including my own industry, the professional services industry. Blockchain itself is probably going to eliminate anywhere from 50 to 70% of the accounting jobs that Deloitte was built on over 150 years ago. So this is a reality affecting everybody, the nature of change. How much time and effort can you put into understanding the nature of change, anticipating the changes that are coming? I will say from my heart, and I'll, I'll reference an individual in the room a little bit later on, at this st age and stage of my life in my 50s, and having been through now my, my third career, I start to get a bit cynical about change. The fact is change is good. Change for the most part of human history has brought about the advancement of humanity. Some things are bad and some things have been incredibly destructive. And if we're not careful, some of the things that are changing can destroy your business, can harm your family, and can potentially at this point because of the scale of technology actually harm the earth itself. But change is good. So look for the threat, but also look for the opportunity in there as well. 
Uh, growing up as a young kid in Scarborough, uh, having immigrated from Jamaica, you know, my life was in the physical world. I got together with my friends by going and knocking on their door and see if they wanted to go outside and play ball. We went over to the schoolyard and we played throwing a ball against the wall or against each other's heads in the schoolyard. We went home to dinner and we communicated with our family about how the day went. Now you can imagine most of the kids growing up today communicate and get together online and they meet online and they discuss with their parents what went on online. And so the world has changed. It's no longer just a physical world, it's a converged world. We're literally we're split between what time we spend together in a physical space like this and the time we spend together increasingly on digital platforms. Canada is the largest producers of social media apps and one of the largest consumers of digital media anywhere in the world. Disproportionately, Canadians spend more time online and increasingly more online. So what does that mean for your customer base? What does it mean for your vendor supply chain? What does that mean for your own employees who could potentially work from home or work from distance in order to support you. Some of you might actually have employees at work or vendors that work on, a, on another part of the world. Algorithms and, and AI. As coming in here today, and I was just quickly looking through my Twitter feed and I saw yet another example of um, our CEO putting out a notice about artificial intelligence that it can now do uh, lung cancer predictions, uh, diagnosis better than, than doctors can, uh, a particular algorithm. Fantastic. At some point, people who are suffering from illnesses in this room, people who are concerned about climate change, people who are concerned about whether or not they can automate their business, you're going to have a huge advancement by AI. The other end of the scale, badly crafted AI, badly implemented AI programs, bad use of algorithms, data that feeds those algorithms can create unintended outcomes of disproportional impact. I don't know about you, but my phone can now talk to my toothbrush. So in the morning when I'm brushing my kids' five-year-old, my five-year-old's teeth, there's a chip in that phone, that, that, that toothbrush, that allows me to know when I need to change the, the toothbrush. Well, it communicates with my smartphone. I don't know what they're talking about. They're probably talking about the fact that I don't brush my, my kids' teeth well enough. I don't know. Um, or it's looking at the photographs that I just took uh, from my birthday party last night. That information is stored, in some cases it's shared, in some cases it's shared and stored in ways that I'm not even aware of. Again, this is the reality of the Internet of Things. Everything talks to everything. That's an amazing ability for you to create a security system for your business or for your home, but if that system isn't created in the right way, you could actually create additional vulnerabilities where people tap into the things that are supposed to be securing you and your family and convert that and weaponize that against you. This is a global village. It is now a global market, and it operates 24-7. And your brand and your, your product are out there all around the world in places that you can't imagine and that you're not monitoring, which is great. If your brand is great, then your product is great. It's not so great if someone's trashing you and they've got 5,000 followers and they're putting up a live stream YouTube video about the experience they just had dealing with you or one of your, one of your employees. And so again, how much ability do you have to set up a social media monitoring site to make sure that you're tracking your reputation on certain key platforms, putting in some basic metrics so at least once a day you can look at a dashboard and go, huh, okay, that's what people are thinking about me. It informs me, I can make some adjustments, or there's a potentially a crisis here and I've got an early warning or at least an earlier warning that I would have waiting for the client to come back in and give me the direct feedback. All right. Let's talk about the threat actors. Now, again, I just want you to remind you, this is sort of the dark and scary part of the whole presentation. The fact is, most good actors, most actors are good people. They're people that want to be informed. They're looking for services. They want to create a trusted relationship with a, with a vendor, with a company. They want to have a relationship with a, with a human being. And they want to interact with you and your business in some way. Or your family, as the case may be. But the reality is, even in the Garden of Eden, there was a snake. And there's a few snakes in this Garden of Eden. They're just a little more sophisticated than they used to be. So the tradecraft of the threat actors has exponentially grown. There was a time as a, as a cop walking the beat, there were very few people who knew how to commit a fraud, to pass a bad check. Not a lot of people knew how the banking industry worked. Not a lot of people could get access to checks. And not a lot of people would have the smarts and the parts to walk into a small business and actually pass it in order to create a fraud and, and gain some monetary advance. The fact of the matter is, anybody can go online. And if you have a little bit of computer skills, you can go deep under the line into the deep web. And there are literally play-by-play -play cookbooks 
for the most sophisticated fraud activities in an individual capacity and on scale. You can literally talk to nation state actors who have the most sophisticated capabilities. You can buy tools with relatively small amounts of money to make your ability to create online white collar type crime to go from a rookie to an all star with a very short period of time and very little investment. The other half of the matter is, once you're into online crime, white collar crime, where you're not actually going in and passing over a check that we could dust for fingerprints, investigating you becomes very, very difficult. Mainly because most of you will never report those frauds. When you do report it, most police agencies do not have frontline police officers who are going to be able to receive that report and conduct an online investigation. We have the best police agencies anywhere in the world right here in Canada. We have the number one justice system anywhere in the world right here in Canada. But the reality is, right here in Canada, like everywhere else in the world, the bad guys are way ahead of the good guys. Looking for the law enforcement and policing to be your number one protector against fraud, online crime, or even physical crime occurring in and around your business is becoming less and less of a viable prospect, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses. And so defense and monitoring and reducing harm are your best ways to address it. Hopefully, if you are a victim, you'll report it. Hopefully, when you report it, it'll be to a police officer or an agency that has developed some capability around the threat actor tradecraft. They can conduct online investigations. If they're lucky enough, they can identify the data or information that was taken from you. If they're even more lucky, they can access the database where that particular um, data resides. And if it's in Russia or in Iran, there's no way to get that data back into this country. And so even if they can do the investigation, even if they can achieve attribution, meaning they know someone who did it, getting the data back in here and then mounting a successful prosecution in a court of law where a crown attorney and a judge would understand the nature of the online investigation, those are all reasons why criminals are moving further and further away from showing up in your store and taking money from your till and moving further and further online because they're less likely to be reported, discovered, investigated, prosecuted, incarcerated. So, cyber threat actors, who are they? Is this that shadowy group that operates out of a factory somewhere in Central Asia? Is this a group of organized crime members who have paid, you know, PhD students coming out of MIT to sit together in a cabal and attack en masse entities like you? Is it that pimply-faced kid in their grandmother's basement who spends 23 and a half hours on day online? And it's all of those folks, and that's the reality. The physical actors are still there. For those of you that own a variety store or a cleaner, a dry cleaner, you operate a 24-7 business, you operate a retail outlet, you are still potentially victimized by shoplifters, people who will commit small assaults, people who might commit an armed robbery. These are all the realities of those of you that still have a physical space or a mostly physical space where you're in a, a dense urban environment or even a remote rural environment, the physical threat of actors. But they've got new tools as well. So instead of having to sit in a car and surveil your property late at night, they can just fly a drone across the property, map everything out, geocode that, and pretty well have a master plan before they even you know, come anywhere close to your property. And so again, the reality is cyber criminals still use a physical space. Physical criminals still use the cyberspace to exploit against potential victims. This is one that really gets talked about, but one that actually commits the vast majority of crimes and victimization within any size business, small, medium, or large. It's your own employees. Now, in most cases, it's their indif indifference, ignorance. They just simply don't follow your, whatever your governance is, whatever password protection practices you have. They're the ones that click on the link without thinking. They're the ones that just have never invested any, in any personal hygiene or, they, or any corporate security hygiene that you've asked them to do. They need to rush through their tasks as opposed to think about the security and, and enterprise that you're running. And so probably the biggest investment you can make before tackling you know, geopolitical na nation state organized crime members is just looking at your own employees. And for those of you that actually work out of your own home, your insider threat expands from your employees, unfortunately, right into the family and into the home. I can't tell you how many times I've had to sit my little 12-year-old daughter down and say, okay, do you know the risk that you just put yourself to by what you just posted online? How many times have I had to sit down with her and say, did you change your password without telling me? 
When you change your password, did you go from one that was pretty strong that I gave you to one that is pretty easy to, to pick up? And even those things, my, my wife ordered in a new Wi-Fi system from our provider, our telco provider. And I was traveling on business for a while. I didn't realize that we hadn't changed the original Wi-Fi password from what the, manu the, 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 the supplier had given. And again, a good friend of mine who will introduce you very shortly said, dude, you've got to change that Wi-Fi password. And in fact, he was over for dinner. And I said, well, change it for me. Let's get, it, let's get secure here. But that's the reality. If you're running a business out of your home, if your family are employed in your business, they now become part of that insider threat chain of risk and reward. And so teaching good cyber hygiene and practicing good cyber hygiene in your home will actually help you to secure your work as well. All right, we're coming out of the dark and scary part. Five good ideas. To some degree, I've indirectly referenced them already. Let's do a deeper dive. Small and medium-sized businesses, there's a security spectrum that I want you to think about. The first part, that fancy looking safe there. You need to understand what the assets in your, build, in your business are. Okay, assets, fancy thing. What's valuable to you as a business owner? You would be surprised. Fortune 500 companies, when I ask them this question, they haven't really thought about it. If they've thought about it, they haven't really done a rigorous review. And if, they haven't done, if they've done a rigorous review, they haven't actually done anything to secure those valuable assets to a greater degree than they had before. And so, again, is that a product that you sell? Is it a service that you provide? Is it the person who built the product or who delivers the service? Is it the IP that's related to the product or the service? Is it the physical facility, the capital assets, your vehicles, your property that you own? Have you secured them properly? Do you know what they are and have you secured them properly? If you don't actually know what's most valuable to your business, you're least likely to be able to protect those most valuable assets. The middle part relates to those threat actors, the weakest link. Whatever the weakest link is in your security system, however mature or immature it is, that's where the bad guys are looking for. So if you don't have a particularly good lock on the front door, that's probably where they're going to come through. If you don't have a particularly good set of passwords on your cyber doors, that's probably where they're going to come through. So look for the weakest link. I'll give you a hint. Second hint, it's probably your own employees and family members that are most likely to click on the link because social engineering, tricking somebody, the human being is actually easiest to trick because there's a thousand different ways to do it. There's only one way to go through a deadbolt. There's only one way to go through a password. You gotta brute force those things. But to go through a human being that is open to flattery, that can be tricked, that can be distracted, who can be tired, who could be going through mental health issues, there's so many different ways to exploit a human being. And so social engineering of the people that work closest to you and closest to those most valuable assets are the things that are most likely to be the vulnerable point, your weakest link. At the end of the day, you are all going to be victimized. I have been victimized. My personal accounts have been hacked. I have been targeted online. And so you, none of us are immune to this. So it's not a matter of if, but when you become a victim. How quickly will you realize you've been victimized? Will an alarm go off to let you know your back door has been to your warehouse has been compromised? And so you can get down there before they remove everything out of the warehouse? Will alarm go off if your data has been breached? Will you know by your own ability to monitor or by some other person's ability to monitor? That could be the physical eyes of your employees. It could be your neighbor, neighboring businesses who keep an eye on you because you're working in the, same, um, in the same mall area. Is it your neighbors at home who can keep an eye on your place while you're away? Will they call you? Is it a device that you set up like a ring doorbell that can monitor your, your premises while you're away? And so if you're not monitoring, you won't know when you've been victimized. You can't reduce the amount of time to respond and mitigate against the loss and learn from what took place in order to be even more target hardened going forward. So know your assets, address your weakest links, and recognize you will be victimized at some point. How do you reduce the damage, learn from the instance, and then make yourself even more resilient going forward? Pretty well any business is going to have a spectrum of security risks associated to a spectrum of business activities. This is from a spectrum that goes from the pure physical world into the pure cyber world. And if you look on what I guess would be your, the, the left-hand side of that screen, um, you're going to have police, res police response and private security if you happen to contract them as a physical response in the general ecosystem around which your, your enterprise works. 
Most of you will have some sort of a facility in which you work in. Very few people are actually a virtual business where literally you're walking around with mobile devices, contracting and transacting online. Somebody's going to work out of a basement uh, office, or you're going to have a storefront rental, or you're going to actually own property, but your facilities. We move then from the perimeter of, we move to the perimeter of your facilities, sensors and CCTV cameras that you might be having to monitor in and around your business, mobile communications, again, increasingly you're doing business and transacting, even as a business owner online, your vehicles, that you, if you might own or operate them, or have a supply chain, going into your e-commerce point of sale. Uh, we talked about IoT, as you're installing a new, a, a new camera system and it's now talking to your lighting system and your HVAC system, so IoT is happening across your supply chain. Everyone gets something from somewhere within that global village. Um, people need to have ID and access. That's those passwords pieces. You might have a cloud service provider or your own um, database that you have within your facility or, or in another location. Um, and then into your hardware, the actual computers and, and laptops that you have. Finally, software, if that's part of your your business line. That's not an exhaustive list, but it gives you a pretty good idea of the spectrum of things that make a business work. Every one of those surfaces, the physical surface and the cyber surface, there's a potential way to exploit a valuable asset, a weak link, and to go about it in a way that will give, you, give a threat actor time to take something or plant something and later take something. And that's the, the spectrum around which you have to defend your businesses now. It's not just the front door and the back door. So we talked about asset mapping earlier on. What are your crown jewels? Digital assets, IT systems and software, data, your website, your social media platform, intellectual property. Those are all your, what I would call your cyber assets. Your physical assets, cash or equivalents, facilities, employees. Your employees themselves are incredibly valuable. Someone gets punched in the nose during a robbery and they quit. If you run a very slim staff, you might not have 12 hours where you can cover that shift. Now that's you coming in. Making them feel healthy, mentally healthy and physically healthy are incredibly important. And if they could be vulnerable online, then giving them tools to be more safe online. Cyber hygiene taught at work can help your employees to, be to have that hygiene going home. And so you're creating a value proposition by just doing these very simple things that don't cost a lot of money, but require intentionality. So identify your digital assets and identify your physical assets. Let's talk about the weakest link. You need to do a threat assessment against those weak links. What are the areas where your business has been traditionally vulnerable and what are the areas that you can conceive of in this fourth industrial revolution, this online world, where you might have new challenges? Workplace harassment and workplace violence, again, traditionally tends to be one of the most underreported and, and actually occurring incidents within, within the work environment. Physical crime, which we talked about, assaults, robberies, natural disasters. Someone, I was just at the um, Civic Action Summit here in Toronto and an expert on urban, um, urban disaster planning said in the, for the last 2,000 years, maybe even longer, fire was the number one threat to a city. London would burn down. Parts of Toronto would burn down. What's the number one threat to cities now? Anyone want to take a guess? Water, right? Overland flooding, flooding that comes up through the drainage systems, mold that comes from as a result of it. I live down in the beaches here, and I can tell you the whole volleyball courts are wiped out by, by the amount of wa water and, and, and rain that we've had in the last little while. So consider natural disasters and how to get new insurance around that or at least protect your, your business against it. Family and home security. Again, I referenced that. If, if your employees are family members or if you work out of the home, that is as much of a threat environment as your business environment. In fact, probably more so. And then ultimately, occupational health and safety, making sure your people are safe, healthy, and they feel supported by management. Flipping over onto the cyber side of it, uh, distributed denial of services attacks that can knock your website offline or your ability to, to transact, reputational harm. Somebody who simply has never even been a client of yours can put all sorts of misinformation online about you and your business, and if you're not aware of it, it could be eating into your small profit and loss margin. Ransomware increasingly is moving from securing your data to securing your physical facilities. So I'll give you an example. A small hotel chain, a boutique chain in Europe, was attacked by having their electronic door locks secured by a threat actor. Nobody could get in or out of their hotel rooms. Can you imagine business people or families who are trying to travel and can't get out of their hotel room? Once that happens, the reputation of that small boutique hotel is trashed. 
people will go anywhere else other than there. So it's not just ransoming your data, but it could be ransoming your physical facilities because of that IoT factor. Corporate espionage, probably not a direct attack factor on small and, and medium-sized business unless you're developing unique IP that later on can be monetized to an extremely high level. So Liberty Village and the small startup community that are developing some of the most in, in, in influential and potentially impactful IP could be the, uh, the source of an attack from a nation state. More likely, they're looking at your weak databases and your client profiles and your individual information and they're scooping up massive amounts of data by simple attacks against people like yourself, which will be then leveraged in some other way against a larger target. So, be secure, protect your place, be proactive. Crime prevention through environmental design, cybersecurity by design, privacy by design. Think about being vigilant across the entire enterprise and in increasingly across the entire ecosystem in which your enterprise is working. And then be aware that at some point, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you're gonna be victimized. How resilient will you be? How quickly will you identify that you are being victimized? How quickly can you assess the nature of the threat that's now impacting you? How quickly can you address this threat? How quickly can you learn the lessons from it? And how quickly can you make an investment so you're less likely to be re-victimized again in the same way? Again, looking at it from two different things, you've got a, a, a large amount of internal ecosystem work that you can do, set good passwords, do penetration tests, set good policy for your employees, practice cyber hygiene, produce cyber hygiene lessons and opportunities, monitor and respond to things that are your valuable assets. Anytime there's a new patch in a system, your Apple iCloud is updating itself, you make sure you patch and update as quickly as you possibly can. War game, if you actually have the time to think about all right, what's our biggest threat to our biggest asset? Sit down with your employees and even just mentally or through a conversation. All right, if we get attacked on this or if we lose this asset or if this asset is targeted in some way, how would we respond? That alone would give you some practice before the actual crisis would come. Set up good firewalls for your systems as well. Into the larger ecosystem, think about VPNs, uh, cloud and how secure that, that, that is. Managed service providers, again, I know there's not a lot of extra money to, to, to potentially invest in this area, but if you simply can't do this because you don't have the ability or the time or the capacity, you might employ somebody else to provide a layer of security monitoring and response to your organization. USB keys are some of the, still some of the simplest ways for people to get into your systems. Um, I actually did my presentation on a USB key, but I stopped bringing it, so I don't want to plug anything into Liz's uh, computer systems. Social media accounts should be monitored because they can be compromised very quickly. People can take them over and do all sorts of bad things on them in your name. Wi-Fi, I talked about the Wi-Fi example, and ultimately your supply chain. One of the greatest cyber and physical exploits in history were done through the supply chain. Basically, if you think of a Middle Eastern company that has a large nuclear program, someone in another country, maybe someone's in other countries, decided to plant a small piece of malware into the supply chain of a, of a national nuclear industry. That malware infected the actual operations of the nuclear industry by making a particular dial read one way when it was actually reading another way. A couple years into this exploit, the nuclear program almost ground to a halt. It was a major play on both the physical and the cyber side. Now, it doesn't need to be that sophisticated, quite frankly, to victimize any one of us in this room. All right, I'm into the last minute, so let's wrap this up. I talked about the ecosystems. So within your, in, in, your internal ecosystem, I know a lot of you are your IT leader, your, your legal leader, your HR leader, your operations leader, I get it, you wear multiple hats. But whether you have separate people under those hats or you're wearing all those hats at the same time, you gotta step back a little bit and map out how this plays out. Are you hiring people that have some cyber hygiene training? Are you bringing people and promoting them and giving them access to critical databases and making sure that their, their training has been updated or their responsibilities around that have been updated. So you're wearing your IT, legal, and HR, and operations hat all at the same time while being the manager and thinking about the financial bottom line. So whether you're wearing multiple hats or you've got multiple people wearing one hat, you've got to look at the cyber and physical impacts, your security and assets, securing your assets across the entire enterprise. And then you move even further out. Think about your supply chain, regulatory bodies, family and home, police and emergency service providers, the community that can be your best eyes and ears and teachers. Time's up. All right. Five good resources. The Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. 
Recently opened, massively funded, still growing. You can go to their website and file, find all sorts of resources that you can tap into at any time. Very simple to use language. Even a Luddite like me can actually learn a few things from it. This is a, a US-based uh, organization, but I, when I was searching online preparing for this, they actually had a very good section, very user-friendly section on small business cybersecurity. It's called the Small Business Cybersecurity Corner. The website is there. I think it's going to be provided for you, so you don't need to rush to write these things down. Uh, it's not all about cyber. Community, sorry, crime prevention through env environmental design. This is securing the physical environment within which you work. It might be simply clearing away shrubbery and bushes, putting good locks on your doors, creating line of sight inside your, your operating area, putting in uh, proper uh, access and control systems. There's any number of things that you can do from an environmental design that are relatively cheap that can provide that physical security. And this is an Ontario website that can provide information there. Ritesh Kotak. Now, Ritesh, you've got to stand up because he's actually in the room. Ritesh, please you stand up for a second. So this is my good friend. Ritesh uh, was one of the best uh, police leaders that uh, worked with me back in Toronto Police. He was actually my cyber guru that taught me most of what I'm actually teaching you actually today. More importantly, he and his family run a small and medium-sized business right here in Toronto. And in fact, Ritesh set up the first physical security system and the current cyber system for his family's business. And so he knows and probably knows more on this topic than even I do. Uh, he's also a guest speaker on CTV and talks a lot about cybersecurity and, and, and the changes going on. So you can watch him online or you can corner him right after this and ask him a whole bunch of questions that he can answer better than me. My simple here, there are a ton of smart people that really get the space. They're your neighbors, they're your friends, they're potentially your employees. In this case, Ritesh worked for me, and he helped to advance the cybersecurity capabilities of the Toronto Police Service, the largest municipal police service in Canada, by virtue of his knowledge as a millennial. He could see and understand things better than old dogs like me. And you've got a Ritesh in your life, so reach into that person, tap into them, give them respect, open up yourself to be taught by a younger person, and amazing things will happen. Last but not least, Teach your kids, teach your grandparents, teach your parents, teach yourself. I am constantly learning, constantly making mistakes, constantly having to remind myself that as smart as I am, as wise as I am, as experienced as I am, I still haven't caught up with where the curve is. And so be humble. Um, recognize that these are the skills. We used to teach our kids how to walk safely across the street, you know, street proofing our kids. You got to cyber proof your kids even before they can walk. The fact is that both of my kids had a had a smartphone in their hands, and were accessing the World Wide Web before they could even walk. And so this is the reality. We've all got to learn how to walk again in this fourth industrial revolution.